Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I have a great pleasure in introducing Amy Holder, who is um, uh, one of my um, closest allies in our fight for oral health. I've known Amy for well over six to seven years now, and we've worked closely in a number of practices. Um, um, I, when we thought of this topic, I couldn't pick um, a more suited person um, to present the perspective that um, uh, is sometimes unfortunately lost in busy general practice. Um, and the idea is um, um, to enjoy the session and hopefully uh, get a good perspective from Amy. Um, and uh, perhaps we can um, exchange some nice questions at the end. Um, many thanks to London Dental Academy for hosting this and organizing it. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, Amy, have a blast. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Amy and I am the founder of The Cambridge Hygienist and also the co-founder of Get Lippy Facial Aesthetics. I am a dental hygiene therapist but primarily only do um, dental hygiene and I qualified in 2012 at the University of Sheffield. So I'm going to start the presentation, how to be an ethical and lucrative dental hygienist. If you have any questions, please do um, just write in the question tab and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you. She says. <laughs> So um, aims and objectives, how to be an integral part of the bigger team, the clinical importance of having a dental hygienist, put down the profit pace and unlock your potential. Are you scared to say the N word? Communication is key. Look after your nurse, dentists and periodontal colleagues. I truly believe this saying and I absolutely adore Marilyn Monroe. Um, I believe that a smile is the best makeup a girl can wear. Um, it's the very first thing that you see and that you notice, which is why you should absolutely 100% take care of your smile. So the clinical importance of having a dental hygienist. We are, dental hygienists are absolutely ambassadors of the practice. We see patients, you know, sometimes I've seen patients around 12 times in one year, depending on what kind of treatment they um, require um, so yeah, so we are a crucial part of the patient's journey to maintain dental work. We reinforce oral health education. We obviously do that in every maintenance appointment, every single time that we see the patient. Um, and we obviously have thorough knowledge of periodontal disease and how to treat it. We have the time to educate patients. So whereas sometimes dentists, they do not have the time we are able to build a rapport with patients. The patients develop the trust with the dental practice um, through, through seeing us so regularly. Patients expect and tend to take on board advice from us because they're paying for it. So dentists quite often ask me, how do I sell the dentist hygienist treatment to my patient? So I always say, like, don't sell the hygienist appointment to the patient. It really doesn't need to be sold. Um, the patient will either want the treatment, they'll either want to see the hygienist, or they won't. Education is key. So just to educate your patient, tell them the benefits of seeing the hygienist. Plant the seed by saying, you know, something along the lines of, did you know that we offer hygienist appointments at our practice? Um, most patients will know what the dental hygienist is, so it basically sells itself. However, what about the new patients or the patients that you feel need to be converted? So, you know, as a dentist, if you've taken over a new dentist list um, where perhaps the periodontal disease might not have been picked up or um, maybe not been expressed in the right way to the patient to, to kind of move them along into the hygienist care. So first of all, does the patient have periodontal disease? Tell them the options. So obviously we have, if you're in the NHS practice, we have the Bantu. So 
absolutely that has to be offered. The second option would be to see the hygienist. So an appointment which is tailored to the patient's needs and a very in-depth appointment. And then thirdly, a periodontal referral. So if the patient doesn't have periodontal disease, explain about the appointment. It's a pre preventative appointment and it's an upkeep. Patients, as we all know, we see some beautiful ladies coming in, their nails are pristine, their makeup is flawless, their hair is all done. They look incredible, but their gums are bleeding. And because they don't see it, they don't believe that it's there. So, you know, they spend hundreds on, on hair, nails, aesthetics, facial aesthetics, and it most, most of it grows back or it needs a top up. So suggest to the patient about perhaps having a visit, just one visit to see the hygienist, and then let the patient make up their own mind. I can assure you that most patients of mine will definitely be converted to seeing a hygienist. I think they find it so incredibly valuable. And as long as you give the patients the options, then they can make the informed decision. So for example, a conversation starter. Have you considered seeing our lovely hygienist for an appointment before? Or have you been offered an appointment to see the periodontal specialist? And another way, another way to kind of bring this conversation along is to maybe mention about the DEN plans, the dental plans that we offer. So the biggest one out there, everybody knows, is obviously the DEN plan. And alongside that, most practices kind of have their own practice plan. Um, which generally have the allocated hygiene visits included in the plans, um, which is a great way to upsell if, again, you're converting your patients to private dentistry. Are you a scaling monkey? So are you kind of sitting there day in, day out, just scaling away, polishing in and out, kind of like Tesco almost, the patients are coming in, they're coming out, you're not really looking at the patient you're not really treating them holistically you're kind of getting a little bit stuck in your old ways and you know some some hygienists are even hanging up their coats because they're just so bored of the same mundane scaling and polishing and let's be honest most patients think the hygienist is purely for stain removal more cosmetic and they don't i don't think they honestly understand the role of the hygienist so are you informing your patients so basically put down the puppy paste and unlock your potential. So firstly, absolutely treat your patients holistically. As soon as they walk through the door, you, you can kind of weigh up your patient fairly fast. Um, some patients are not as simple as a scale and polish. So, you know, you also need to manage your patient, your patient's expectations. And, you know, as soon as you, yeah, as soon as you take one look at the patient, you're going to know if that patient's going to need a course of treatment or if it's just a maintenance appointment or if they're going to need any anything else in further detail, such as a referral. Um, so personally, I like to sit the patient up as soon as I notice any findings. My nurses will all totally agree with you. I kind of look at them and they know straight away the oral B flip chart. That's, that's my go to. That is literally my my little Bible that I will just show every patient. And it's such an easy way to explain um, periodontal disease. So I think as, if you sit your patient up and you're, you're eye to eye contact rather than looking down at them while they're in the chair and trying to explain things, then it will probably go in, in well, they'll probably understand it a lot more using a flip chart. So yeah, so add value to your services by educating your patient first. I remember when I first finished university and I, I looked at my book and it was pretty full and everybody was in for half an hour and I read the previous hygienist notes and they were all in for just normal scale and polishes. And I thought, oh my goodness, okay, let's just take one patient at a time. And the first patient that I saw had quite serious, quite severe gum disease. And I thought, oh my goodness, I have not got, I've not got enough time to do this in this appointment. I, am, I was totally overwhelmed. And I just thought, how am I going to manage the patient's expectations, manage this patient ethically and you know, at the end of the day, this patient needs to be educated. 
so I went on a, a really, really good informal um, course and basically taught me how to treatment plan. So, you know, you always um, present scientific information to support your findings, show the patient in the mirror their pockets. So, for example, explain what a UNC 15 probe is. You know, I like to say it's a mini gum ruler. It's, you know, it's something that we use to measure your pockets. Um, and there, there we go. It's fairly straightforward. The mirror always comes out. I show the patient the pockets in the mirror. And, you know, seeing is believing. It really is. If a patient understands what you're trying to to show them and you're trying to improve their oral hygiene and improve their periodontal disease then they kind of get on board a lot faster um, so I and I always print out the periodontal charting as well highlighting the pocketing and the bleeding and yeah I mean we most most hygienists like to disclose and do a plaque score so I mean yeah so basically you're trying to support your findings and then I guess invite the patient back for more in-depth treatment which could incur a higher fee because it's more complex treatment such as non-surgical periodontal therapy <laughs> I'm just going to mute someone who's chatting away <laughs> just give me a second Galaxy S8, who are you? <laughs> there we go, we're muted. So, just going back to that. So, exactly. So, you, you've, you know, you've found that the patient has periodontal disease, you've explained it, you've educated the patient, and you're going to invite the patient back for. Yeah, but that's not working now. Where's the slash? Yeah, so you're inviting the patient back in more depth for more in depth treatment, which could incur a higher fee. So just remember, you know, communication is absolute key. Treatments. Do you have a treatment menu? Um, for me, this is absolutely so, so important for every single practice. Um, when I started working at a practice around the corner from from um, from well from where Fard works, I kind of went in and I was a little bit, you know, along the lines of, okay, so I'm a hygienist. I know for a fact that I can offer at least, you know, four four values, four treatments to the patient. So, you know, I mentioned, okay, how do you feel about creating a treatment plan? Then the patient knows the services that we that I can offer. So he said, okay, then let's try it. So we changed the times around a little bit, um, added the fees because, you know, for example, airflow wasn't even really being carried out. So yeah, so I would absolutely, if anybody wants to copy this really basic treatment menu, or if anybody wants a copy of mine um, with the price list and everything, just let me know and I'll email it across to you. So Obviously, we um, have the dental hygiene maintenance appointment. We have the dental hygiene extensive appointment. So these are for patients which are just a little bit more hands-on. Um, dental hygiene, non-surgical periodontal surgery. So your, for me, that would be my 24-hour um, root surface debridement appointments, which tend to be done one in the morning, one in the evening, or afternoon, whatever works best for yourself and the patient. Obviously, anaesthetics used in that appointment as well. So we obviously need to make sure that's worn off. End again, flapless placement. So I have used this a few times. I've used it under really under um, prescription from the dentist. And also, I recently referred a patient to FARD who said, Amy, you can 100% treat this patient with end again, flapless. So yeah so we gave it a go so we're just kind of waiting now obviously it will take a whole year to just really really see if it's 100 percent work because of the radiographs need to be taken and everything but again it's something that you can offer as a hygienist it's not it's not 
you know, it's not above you. You are totally 100% able to do all of this. Um, stain removal, so an airflow treatment, um, your fissure sealants, the tooth whitening as well. I know a lot of hygienists really, um, we have quite a lot of barriers with regards to tooth whitening because it has to be prescribed by a dentist. I am really fortunate from the point of view is of, um, I have one dentist who will quite happily write prescriptions for me to do the tooth whitening. And we have, you know, I, I give her a certain percentage of, of the amount and it, work, it works well for both of us. Um, vice versa, you know, I'll also send other treatments over. So Invisalign cases, implant cases, etc. And we're gonna come on to that in a little bit. So also as hygiene therapists, we are now able, and we've been able to do it for quite a long time, obviously, but facial aesthetics, your, your anti-wrinkle treatments, your dermal fillers, any kind of skin treatments as well. So we are, we can offer a lot to the practice, absolutely so, so much. Um, so how do you determine what to charge? So obviously the practice tends to, um, you know, decide how much each treatment is. But a, a dentist said to me a long, long time ago, and I know I'm kind of like talking about personal experiences, but I really think, you know, it, it's really helpful. It definitely helps me when I hear about other people's. A dentist said to me, okay, Amy, so, you know, you've been working here a couple of years. What's your, what's your target? And I, I kind of said to him, what do you mean, what's my target? And he said, how much is your, what's your hourly target? And I, I said to him, um, what did I say to him? I was like, honey, money is not for everybody. And he kind of laughed at me. And I'm laughing at myself now because everybody wants to earn money. We want to earn it in an ethical way. And obviously it has to be, everything that we, we do is in the patient's best interest. But he was absolutely right. I didn't have any, any, any goals. As a hygienist, you're kind of fairly limited as to what you can earn in an hourly, you know, an hourly fee. So I, I get paid by percentage um, and it works really well for me. I was paid on an hourly wage when I was a therapist. I think it was about, I'm not sure if it was about 30, 31 pounds an hour, but you earn double that being a hygienist. If you're back to back patients and you are, um, and you're on a percentage. And basically, if you're on a percentage, you kind of have an incentive there to recall your patients and to upsell, which is in your interest and the dentist interest, the, the practice owner's interest. But it's also in the patient's interest because they get to find out what are the services and what treatments and what added values that you actually offer. It prevents you from becoming a scaling monkey. It prevents that repetitive day in, day out, scaling, polishing, scaling, polishing, where your vision just becomes blurred and you don't, you kind of get, sometimes you can get to the point where you're, you haven't really got any motivation. So really think about how, how something is going to get you motivated. And for a lot of people, money gets people motivated. You know, it pushes you and it makes you grow and it makes your, you know, you expand your knowledge by, by setting targets, by setting goals. And I'm a true believer that if I set a goal, I will absolutely reach it. Um, so, yeah, so different treatments, they obviously require different fees. So, you know, a, a fine scale and polish uh, for a well-maintained patient, it should not be costing the same as a patient who requires really complex treatment. So like, for example, your non-surgical periodontal therapy, which is, you know, I know some people work differently. I like to do it in the same day if possible. And if it works well for myself and the patient. Um, so yeah, I'm using a lot, of, a lot of skills. I'm really highly skilled. So why should, I, why should that patient and why should I be charging the same amount of money for that service which is going to take, you know, twice as long. It's going to be, you know, I've got a lot more, um, a lot more skills that need to be used at the end of the day. And you are highly skilled and you're definitely worth it. 
a little bit of L'Oreal coming in there. So don't be afraid of the M word. So talking about money for a lot of people, it's a taboo subject. They get nervous, they get clammy, they, they say, um, um, well, yeah. So you need, confidence is key. You have to be confident. If, if you're going to try and upsell a treatment, you have to know at the back of your head, right, at the end of the day, this is how much it costs. And you can either have this treatment or that treatment. This is, you know, this is ideally the right treatment for yourself. So yeah, you are, you're worth the cost of the treatment, absolutely. And, and like I was saying earlier, you're highly skilled. You're a valuable part of your patient's journey. If you're going to upsell, you must know how much the treatment costs. Patients appreciate knowing the cost first. Um, they might say no today, but it's planted the seed for next time. So just mention, you know, oh, we're offering X, Y, and Z. You might be interested. It, you just plant the seed. And, and I, I love that phrase, plant the seed. I'm just going to keep saying it, to be honest, because that's what it's all about, is letting your patients know their patients' options. And it's absolutely all about how you start your conversation. Absolutely. So just, you know, always, always end on a positive. That's just... That's, that's everything, that's life. So upselling, don't be unethical. Absolutely everything that you advise for your patient should benefit the patient, not your back pocket. So you do need to think, okay, so they've got a tiny little bit of scaling. I could offer them the airflow, but I know I can get that off with a, you know, a, a profi brush. Just be, just, just, I like to treat my patients, the, every single patient that I treat, I think, okay, I pretend it's my mum because I would never hurt my mum and I would never, um, I'd never rip her off. So every single patient I, I treat like they're my mum sitting in the chair. And I've spoken to quite a lot of hygienists and, and dental professionals as a general rule. We, we tend to, to um, focus on, some, on one of our loved ones. We tend to think, okay, so, you know, I'm going to pretend it's mum in the chair there. So conversation starters. Um, so Mr. Smith, for example, are you aware of a more advanced stain removal system that we currently offer? It's £20 on top of your current treatment. It's not something that you'll need at every hygienist to visit unless you want it. So obviously your more advanced stain removal system is your airflow. And, and there you go. You, you've kind of said it, you've again planted the seed. So if they don't, you know, if they don't want it today, they might say next time, oh, I've got a wedding coming along. You know, that advanced stain removal that you mentioned last time, does that, you know, do you think I could have it today? So, I mean, ideally they would have rang up and, and booked it in because otherwise we're going to be running super late, but you know, 10 minutes late for a happy patient, it's definitely worth it. And yeah, definitely worth it. And, you know, I was um, listening to a webinar the other day and this one just kind of came along as well. So I just thought I'd add it. So, um, for example, Mrs. Smith, you're probably not interested, but we offer facial aesthetics at our practice. If I gave you a contact card, could you perhaps pass them on to your friends and family? So you kind of just, again, planting the seeds. You're letting the patient know what services you're offering. Um, Mrs. Smith might go home, look in the mirror and think, oh my goodness, crikey, I need Botox. <laughs> so, you know, so, and then straight away I'll pop into her head, oh, Amy, such and such, she offers it at the practice. So again, there you go, you've planted the seeds or her friend might be talking about it on a coffee morning. You know, it's all about just mentioning it. And again, um, so, Another patient, for example, and I say this probably, you know, quite a lot to quite a lot, actually. So your lower anterior is out of alignment. So and they, they normally say to me, oh, yeah, my teeth at the bottom, they're a bit crooked. And that's why they build up so much plaque. So, again, straight away, plaque, the patient's concerned about the alignment. Have you considered tooth alignment before? And bam, there you go. You've planted the seed. The patient might be interested. You can give them a leaflet. And, and and there you go. Again, your patient's got a gap, lost his front tooth, they've got a, a denture that might be rubbing or it's 
congregating lots of plaque around there. They don't like taking it out. Has your patient considered implants? Could you perhaps um, create a maintenance program to be sold alongside the implant treatment? So for example, a monthly payment plan, which could include four hygiene visits a year, you can adapt this to the cases. So, you know, your, your patient, you know, you might refer your patient to a periodontal specialist and alongside that included in the periodontal fee you could perhaps include your hygiene maintenance appointments it it's included in the price it's already paid for for the patient so they're not thinking oh god i've got another 50 pounds come out i've got another it's already it's already there it's already done so just you know you can do this with invisalign other orthodontic treatments think outside the box and how can you increase revenue for yourself and the practice but also have the patient's best interest at heart and at the end of the day the list is is endless and you're part of a dental team and of course some of these treatments you can't fulfill but a dental associate and most of the dental associates that i work with are, are really good friends of mine now um you know they would be so grateful for the referral and at the end of the day they've referred you the patient so if you can give a little bit back then then they're, they're super they'll be super happy um and, and you know all successful businesses they begin with um a collaborative team so we are one big happy family so adding value so you need to basically increase the patient's perceived value of the treatment. Again, I was, I've was i been so active. I've been watching so many webinars and so many Instagram lives recently, but there was a fantastic one this week and, um, and they mentioned about adding value and it just basically confirmed my beliefs in how you, how you um, perceive your, the treatment and what matters to the patient at the end of the day, they don't really care about the pocketing. They don't understand it. You try and explain it and they, they look at you like, oh yeah, yeah, I understand. But most of the patients, they, they don't understand. And at the end of the day, the only thing that they're gonna care about is, is that treatment going to save their teeth? And that's, that's the, the biggest thing at the end of the day. They don't care if we're gonna get that pocket down to three mil. Um, they just really want to keep keep their teeth. So when do I when do you refer to a periodontal specialist? I so firstly, I always refer to the I always refer the patient in the first instance of diagnosing periodontal disease. Again, sorry to bring this up again, but planting the seed. So, you know, so that that patient can prepare mentally that they may require this service in the future. It's it can be you know, a lot of money. Some treatment plans can go up to about two thousand pounds. But I would, you know, I would try and say to the patient that this is um, this is basically something that you, yeah, it, it's something that's it's absolutely invaluable. They're, they're so valuable. Um, so yeah, if you feel the patient's needs are out of your depth then again absolutely refer the patient on if, if you don't think you can do anything for this patient you must refer them and for myself personally if after two rounds of non-surgical periodontal treatment and if there's still no improvement um then yeah i will refer so i give the two options so i tend to say to the patient okay so you have gum disease and the patient normally either looks at me like oh my god or they or they know that they've got it so I, I always say so the gold standard would be a referral a periodontal referral to see a specialist and within that option you've got your two options you've got your NHS referral so I tend to say advantages for this is the cost it's a lot cheaper um, and unfortunately for, for my area, Cambridge, disadvantages would be the travel. Most patients do need to take a whole day off work to get there. And also um, the waiting list can be quite long as well. So the other option would be a private referral. So the disadvantages there for the patient would be the costs. They can kind of amount up to a couple of thousand in the worst case scenario. 
and the benefits is that they can be seen in the next couple of weeks and and it's around the corner from their house so you know most patients they they, they live so close to where they work so that's not really going to be an issue they can just pop out and have their appointment and go back to work and then the second option is the in-house periodontal treatment with the hygienist so yeah so that would be your non-surgical periodontal therapy once the patient is primed and ready um, absolutely no point in starting any kind of treatment if they've got bleeding copious amounts of bleeding so much plaque that you know patients need to be on board with with their oral hygiene before you even start scaling really so like i said earlier seeing is believing um i always take photos a lot of patients don't like to give consent to sharing them on social media or for um educational needs so unfortunately i do have some photos at the end but it's not many so you know i think we've all probably got that barrier um so the patients that are going to undergo some treatment so for example airflow show your before and after photos of your successful treatments show the pocketing to your patient get your um cp the unc15 probe out show the pocketing explain what's normal what's not show you maybe a section of the healthy gum in the mirror and then show you an area which is super inflamed bleeding use your probe pocket it and uh, just i think they really then start to understand what what exactly is healthy and what's not um so yeah so show the charting on the computer print it out highlight it educate that bleeding is not normal and um and no matter how long they've had it for patients we've all got these patients oh i've had bleeding forever it's normal for me no josephine it's not normal <laughs> you know it, it isn't normal there's a sign of disease that you need we need to get that under control and then again i'm not in any pain so so there's no problem there is a problem gum disease is silent you don't tend to have any pain until the really late stages in which case it's pretty much you know there's pretty much nothing that you can do you can't really do anything for them other than extractions so other treatments to add to your service. So oral cancer screening, absolutely everybody should be doing this. Obviously starting extra orally, going intra orally. Tell your patient that you're doing it. Okay, so I'm going to do an oral cancer screening now. Let the patient know and they'll think, oh, oh, that's really, oh, that's brilliant. Oh, I'm really happy. Um, radiographs, photo evidence. Um, these are so so important clinical evidence you can explain these are diagnostic aids that we use day in and day out and it's so important to show them to your patients they're, they're your patients at the end of the day so you know they've absolutely got a right to see them but I think for me ultimately these are fantastic aids to be using your smoking sensation if you're not up to date on your smoker cessation then maybe go on a course get updated with it there's lots of of new techniques that are out all the time there's something new that's coming out so and you have your laser um including the skin and also facial aesthetics so if you take anything away from today um this is something that i've recently that's recently come to light for me so as a professional and as a, as a general profession we are in a fantastic position to detect areas of melanoma and skin cancer so i don't know if anyone's heard of this charity before um but they basically do a course the masked pro certified course and that's from the charity and yeah i think it's around 40 pounds to do the course it's not a lot of money it all goes to charity and i think you know it's so valuable so so valuable we see areas of the patient that that they might not see so we see the tops of their heads we see the back of the neck we're always looking at the face you know around the around the neck the top the top sections of their hands we see their nails we i have quite a lot of patients that like to take the shoes off in the summer they're flip-flops or we see their feet we see a lot of the patient so i yeah so and again may is the um skin cancer awareness month so again if 
that would be something that I would definitely, definitely highly recommend you to do. All right, so. So we're just going to go through some clinical photos and thought processes with regards to these patients. So this is one of my um, cases. I saw him probably about, I don't know, it was around six months ago now. And um, he's actually due his appointment now. So I was on the phone to him earlier, you know, just checking up on him, making sure he's still doing everything. Because there's always those, those patients that stick in your mind that you think, right, okay, he's due. We've done so much work to get him to this, this fantastic level. I need to ring this guy. So, and uh, yeah, so the one, the photo on the left hand side, quite severe never saw a hygienist before um i think he actually went to the dentist but didn't want any one of those patients that don't want any treatment um but they're still coming they're still paying um god knows why but anyway we, we've we've kind of cracked it and we've sorted it and all i did in the first appointment was oral health education plaque disclosing i used the oral b toothbrush um in mouth demonstration and I did a really quick ID scale, just so that he can get those TP brushes through. Because obviously, as you can see, we are wall to wall with calculus. Um, so he came back three weeks later and I like to bring my patients back three weeks later. I think four weeks is a little bit too long. Some people fall off the bandwagon, they get a little bit lazy. Um, so, yeah, three weeks he came along and he'd been using his electric toothbrush, he'd been disclosing every night and he'd been using his TP brushes. So, okay, right. So the next stage for me was to do a supra gross scale. Uh, again, reinforce oral hygiene. And then I got him back the following week for... 24 hour root surface, so non surgical periodontal therapy with local anesthetic. And it was an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon. And my nurse 100% will remember this because it was pretty hefty grafting, but the results were fantastic. And the patient was just so, so happy. The photo on the right hand side is six weeks after the root surface debridement, so the non-surgical periodontal therapy. And I hadn't done anything. So you can see a little bit of bleeding on the lower right side. And uh, that's just where he's popped a TP brush through, which is a really tricky area for him to keep on top of. Um, oh, I've just forgot to mention actually that when I first saw this patient, I, I said to him, you definitely, the best option, gold standard for you, you must see a periodontal specialist if you know and i went through the nhs and the private options he didn't want to go to london he doesn't have the money to spend so i was kind of the next best option and i'm i've got to say i was super impressed with the results and the patient has managed to mo maintain everything well we'll see because obviously he's due an appointment now so yeah so this uh, these are this is a patient that I referred to Fard. Don't know if Fard, do you want to kind of jump in here? Can you, let me just see. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, don't know if you can remember. I think her first name was Jessica. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> you're fine. Uh, her first name was Jessica, and you referred her about six years ago. She'd noticed um, the gum recession around her lower incisors getting worse. Yes, I, to I definitely remember this lady. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bless and um, basically, um, you helped her try and get some kind of a handle on the gingival health around the lower central incisors. And then she went through a series of um, uh, gingival augmentation. Um, um and during which um she was seeing you for maintenance um now the interesting thing is uh during that journey 
despite the, um, the fact that sutures after mucogingival surgery are left for at least three weeks, two to three weeks. Um, I would often see her for reviews after the suture removal, like a month later, um, and she would have no staining, um, no sensitivity, and uh, she would be quite um, um, motivated to keep the teeth clean and not apprehensive about brushing a surgical site, and that's all down to good supportive therapy. Now, one of the reasons why I asked you just to include this particular case, Jessica's case, is to get an insight from you on what happens in the post-surgical supportive therapy uh, appointments from a hygienist's point of view. What did you do for this lady? How did you get her to brush so effectively and not to be squeamish about brushing a, um, a post-surgical site? How did you get rid of the staining? Now, bear in mind, I would like everyone to have a look very closely at the amylocemental junction of the lower teeth. None of the, um, um, uh, none of the teeth had enamel damage, which can happen um, if a hygienist uses uh, debridement methods um, uh, haphazardly. Uh, so this was uh, uh, a well-maintained, safely maintained post-surgical case. And I'm very interested to find out from Amy how this was done. How did you manage to do that? <laughs> so I'm obviously super, super careful around the, the new gingival graft and um, making sure that my, I use an ultrasonic scaler and just making sure that it was face downwards towards the gingival margin. And yeah, I think obviously it's got, you know, we've got quite good results here, but with regards to the supportive therapy and the, the brushing side of things, making sure that the patient isn't scrubbing and actually making sure that again, like you said, the patient isn't squeamish about cleaning these areas, because I find quite often that if patients have had procedures done like this, they quite often shy away. And that's, again, that's how you get the plaque accumulating around the gingival margin. And unfortunately, that's when I think sometimes these gingival grafts can start to fail because of the, the poor oral hygiene. Um, so a sensitive head with an oral B electric toothbrush. Um, but I th I'm not sure if in this instance this lady, because it was such a long time ago, I'm not sure if this lady actually had the, possibly the Curaprox surgical toothbrush. It's like a little red one with very, very soft filaments. Uh, no, Amy, she, she, that, that, the electric. That, was, that, that was before the Curacep brushes. So she was, um, she was oh. actually using, um, um, the electric. Uh, a, an electric toothbrush, yeah. So that will have been definitely 100% the sensitive head on the oral B, just angled up slightly. Yeah. How did you remove the staining? Because she would have she would have had to use chlorhexidine for no less than three weeks. So I removed the sutures at two weeks, and then she would continue using chlorhexidine for another week. By which point. You know, I don't see them three weeks later. I see them two weeks. You get them at four weeks. So by that point, um, the staining would have been quite prolific. How do you normally approach stain management in these cases? Do you ask for one visit, two visits? Um, and what do you use to remove it? Uh, nowadays, you know, it, 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 you can talk about Jessica, but just tell us what you do currently? So I would probably have um, very carefully used an airflow mm. but again not around the gingival margin so yeah <laughs> I honestly can't remember what I did for this lady I think it was the airflow to be honest um, Yeah, the airflow. Are you there? Have you gone? No, no, I'm here. I'm just uh, <laughs> um, not wanting to butt in. Right. <laughs> Perfect. 
Thanks, Bad. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on to the next one. So again, this is this isn't a case of mine. This is one of Fard's cases, but I think this was popped into the slide just to kind of um, how to manage a patient with drug-induced gingival hyperplasia. So again, lots of supportive therapy. So you know, using the disclosing tablets, the electric toothbrush, the finding out what medication the patient is actually on as well, taking a very detailed medical history. And you can see there's a lot of gingival overgrowth there. There's, there's probably no way that without some kind of intervention from a specialist that this patient's gingival health would have, would have settled. Um, would you agree there, Fad? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the main purpose behind um, sharing these pictures with everyone. Um, I uh, have a mantra that um, doing something is better than doing nothing at all. Um, and um, also having a, a, a certain level of vigilance. Um, and that's one of the things that I've noticed uh, when working with you, um, that you're quite au fait with cases that could become problematic, i.e. could go downhill very quickly, um, and that uh, you're not reserved about trying to help patients. And you know when to exit them from um, a vicious loop of continuous hygienist visits um, whilst not getting any better, in fact, getting worse. Um, this is a classic case where um, having a go, as it were, would have been a bad idea um, because access to the teeth is completely impaired. Um, but at the same time, he was managed with uh, discontinuing medication. Um, there were, there's a white patch lesion um, um, uh, in the upper right hand side which was biopsied um, and he had full mouth uh, resective surgery before multiple visits uh, of supportive post-surgical therapy. Um, could you share with us, and you've maintained a lot of, uh, of my patients over the years uh, post-surgery, could you share with us, and I'm very, very intrigued because I'm never with you in these appointments. I really want to know what happens, <laughs> and this is a good opportunity because they come back looking brilliant. Um, I want to know uh, from you, please, um, how um, you take on board the report of pain after the surgery, um, how you manage um, plaque control, how you go about disclosing them, um, how you maintain the post-surgical sites. Um, uh, I'm a bit different. I'm a bit different from other high, uh, other periodontists. I, I, I'm not very dogmatic about uh, you know not probing after surgery, and I'm, I've often said that to um, uh, my team members. Um, um, so I, I just want to know. Um, from from you, how you felt following this advice over the years? Have you seen any problems? Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I'm intrigued. I'm all ears. Go for it. Tell okay. Me what so, happened. so first of all, you mentioned about the pain aspect. So, so you know, most patients do require local anaesthetic with the, the topical and then obviously your injections, um, which will always be prescribed by a dentist. Um, so you can manage the, the pain from that point of view. Sometimes topical fluoride will help if it's just slight sensitivity. Um, so again, I'll have some patients that come in who have had non-surgical periodontal therapy or have had uh, periodontal surgery with yourself. Um, they, they, they've even got to the point now, oh, can you just pop that little bit of cream on my, uh, on my teeth, please? Because it really helps. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, another option, another way of managing pain, um, plaque control. So obviously Vaseline applied to the lips first. Patients are generally very happy to, um, to have plaque disclosing. Most of my patients know that when they're coming in, that they're gonna be disclosed. So plaque disclose, use Oral-B, um, electric toothbrush, the demonstration in mouth model um, to, to actually interact with the patient, get the, get you know find out how the patient brushes their teeth, then you can 
point them in the right direction. A lot of patients are actually bring their electric toothbrush in to see me as well, so that I can just, and most patients, they always, you know, a lot of patients have still got the same head on when they bought the electric toothbrush, you know, a year ago. Oh, I didn't know that head needed to be changed. So pointing them in the right direction with things like that and discussing electric toothbrush heads as well. Um, so you've got your sensitive head, especially for patients who have got a lot of recession. Um, there's obviously other, other types of brands as well, your Sonicare, Colgate, etc. cetera. Um, I tend to go with the Oral-B. I've, especially for patients who have had periodontal surgery, I feel it's a lot kinder, kinder to the gum line. Um, and patients, they tend to be a little bit more, they comply a lot more, they're more compliable. Um, yeah, so post-surgical sites, how do I look after them? I like to probe, I'm going to agree with you there. Um, I think it's really important to probe just because if you can't probe, how do you know what, how do you know what, what is there, what needs to be looked after, what areas are still inflamed, what areas have delayed bleeding. I, I think it's really important to be able to probe. I tend to probe maybe after six weeks, for example. Um, I know some hygienists might probe earlier, some patients, some hygienists might not probe for three months. I've heard that as well from a, a lecture. Um, but yeah, for me, six weeks, I think is a good, a good time. It's a good healing time as well. And again, I, and another thing that I don't do, I don't obviously chart any pocketing under four millimeters, which was obviously something that was uh, released in the guidelines recently. So what else did you ask me? There was quite a lot of questions there. <laughs> any problems faced? Um, yeah, so any problems faced um, with regards to management of this, these patients? Is that what you were thinking? Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, they were happily seeing you for the post-surgery maintenance. Um, plaque control was managed really well. Uh, and most sites recover um uneventfully um and the main thing is um uh, the recall the intensive recall post-surgical recall was adhered to and that's another interesting thing about working with you um and it ties in with the topic of uh, your talk about how um you're an ethical and and lucrative hygienist for your practice how do you ensure that um, the patient's recall is adhered to, both in the post-surgical phase, but also in general. Um, they, they don't let go of it, because often I've seen them uh, at the reassessment, I've said, well, everything's resolved. Uh, maybe at one year, I have a radiograph showing bone growth and consolidation. Um, they might kind of uh, let it go, uh, but that doesn't seem to happen. Um, and they, they're still in your loop of recalls um, and you tend to exit them again if you're, if you're concerned and refer them back to me. So I'm, yeah. I'm very interested about how you orchestrate this recall um, um, uh, approach. Sure. So I think for me, I'm so, so lucky at the practices that I work at. The reception team and the nurses are fantastic. If um, what we tend to do is as soon as a patient exits the surgery, they'll go obviously go to reception, make the payment. And at that point, they will make their next appointment. Sometimes patients who have seen yourself, so high risk patients, patients who have gone through a course of non-surgical periodontal therapy with myself, they will, I would quite, I'll quite often offer them a block booking. So they might book for the year and this is actually really successful because it really makes the patient take on board how how important it is to keep up with the appointments um i think it adds value really to to the appointment and to the maintenance aspect so so yeah so a lot of patients they will block book some patients i have i mean i have some patients who are on a two month recall because i know if they go any longer they fall off the bandwagon and they get sidetracked. They've got busy lives. They've got busy jobs, you know, diff shift patterns. Um, they, you know, these are the patients which are high risk. 
I also have a list of patients as well, a personal list which is kept at each practice for my high risk patients. So if I'm, I'm kind of, I've been working at a woman practice for uh, four years, was it five? Four years now and another practice seven years. So I've kind of got a, a really good rapport with these patients. I don't see very often many new patients so the patients that are um, that are new, they stick out like a sore thumb. Really, I completely remember them. I remember the name, I remember the face. You know, they they as soon as I get into work and I'm in my work mode, I know. Okay, such and such as due when I and then I have a little search. If they're not booked in, then I'll I'll personally call the patient. I, I think patients appreciate that. I think they they feel you know that that's adding value to our service it's, mo it's more personable of course they're happy to have a receptionist call them but you know if I've got a spare five minutes and the patient the reception's crazy busy which is always the case then yeah I'm, I will bring the patient and pop them in the diary so yeah yeah <laughs> Well done, thank you. I think that covers it all. <laughs> thank you. So, um, yeah, so that's coming to the end of the presentation. Well, it is the end of the presentation. Do you have any questions? Um, now, if, um, if any of the audience has a, um, a question, please feel free to type it in the chat um, um, area of the, the uh, application. Um, and I will relay it to um, Amy. Um, Amy, congratulations on a wonderful talk, very inspiring. And whilst um, um, our, our lovely audience uh, are, are putting questions together, I would like to um, let you know a little bit about my background, Amy. You probably don't know this, but back in 2013, I stepped in as a hygienist at Antwerp Group for about a month. Um, to do quality assurance and uh, it is hard it's not easy um, um, and you know I found it quite um, um, inspiring how a hygienist can step into a practice and proceed to um, develop a list um, with, um, as you called it earlier, back-to-back -back patients. Now, I'm aware of how to do this from a dental point of view, for, as a dentist and as a specialist, but I'm not really sure how a hygienist can do that. Could you enlighten me a little bit? How do you build a list and, make, and, and, and achieve a back-to-back -back sort of um, a, a efficient list? yeah sure so i think ultimately it's again it's creating value and adding value to your your the service that you're providing i mentioned earlier about treatment planning um a treatment menu and you know these this is something that i think everybody would definitely benefit from having if you don't have one already in the practice but it allows you to to offer all kinds of treatments and therefore from you know from doing that you're able to build up a list of patients who who want different things for example um, and you know i think it's really really important that you you explain for the very first for the patient's very first hygienist appointment it's super important that you explain everything that the hygienist does and what we do for the patient so we are we're basically ambassadors of the practice i think um you know we we see patients day in and day out and it's just it's just um yeah i think from doing from that point of view you can actually establish a list because the patient does want to come back and then, you know, quite rapidly, your diary starts filling up. The, um, I remember when I first started, um, when I first qualified on my first job, I, they, they didn't have a hygienist position at this particular practice. 
I was creating one um, because I wanted a hygienist, but they didn't have any patients for it. So it was an orthodontic practice. And I just thought, oh, my goodness, this is definitely something which, you know, there's so much potential at this practice. Um, and initially I picked up half a day. So I did like, I think I was doing Tuesday afternoon and I might have had one patient in that was referred to me from one of my colleagues and then, you know, dripped and dripped through and then before you know it the patients are their recalls are coming through and your diary is building up and it's, it's getting again back to back so you you kind of have to start if, if you're at a practice where you haven't ever had a hygienist at you're basically starting from scratch but then for another point of view you could do you know meetings with the dentist do lunch and learns have have conversations with the dentists um you know how again how do you sell it to your patient what how do you get the patient on board with the hygienist appointments and you can kind of give them little pointers and and a little bit of direction and then again you know i think it's so important that as a team you're you're communicating effectively you're talking to each other um and one appointment can lead will lead to several more so i think that's kind of how the diary has just got so so busy um, we have a question here on the same um, 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 topic uh, yeah. from Sarah from Sarah Townsend. Um, she's asking you, do you have any non-engaging patients and how do you manage them? Hi, Sarah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, of course, I have patients that come in and they are not interested. And, I, and often I'm kind of sitting there thinking, you're not interested you're not looking at me when I'm talking to you they're just so not engaged and quite often I kind of say I will sit the patient up and if they're, they're being a little bit awkward I, I tend to say okay what are your expectations from this appointment and start in engaging in a conversation like that and if they say well I don't know what I'm here for the dentist just sent me um you can kind of pop the patient back again okay well let's have a look around let's see what's going on or if that you know there might not be anything going on in which case you know you don't need to have the appointment obviously there's always something going on but I think find out what the patient's expectations are and if the patient doesn't want to be there then then don't treat them because I think you're kind of falling into an area where you you're going to you're setting yourself up for a fall really you need to make sure that you and your patient are both on the same page um i hope that answers your question brilliant thank you amy that's that, that was wonderful that's um uh, that, that's a paradigm that the gps tend to follow and you're kind of doing it instinctively i'm not i'm not sure if you've you've, you've actually attended a talk about that or read anything about it but it, it, it's okay. a concept called ice Oh, right. I, ideas, concerns, and expectations. And that's what a GP does um, uh, surreptitiously when you visit them. So you're kind of doing that. And that's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, the, we have another question um, from Julia Walker. Um, she's asking you if you use loops for uh, non-surgical debridement and do you recommend TP brushes twice a day to your patients? Hi Julia, oh, I've qualified to Julia, I know Julia really well, um, I hope you're well. Um, so I actually don't use loops, I'm probably in the minority there um, and there isn't actually a reason why I don't use them. I tried them once before and I kind of felt I, I didn't really get on with them. I tried them for probably about a week and I, I, for some reason, I just couldn't really get my head around them. I mean, obviously, I'm open to trying them again. I probably should give them another go. Um, but there's absolutely no reason why I'm not using them other than I just didn't feel particularly comfortable wearing them. I do wear my own glasses. Um, so my eyesight is pretty good as well. <laughs> But obviously, I know loops have got their advantages. And with regards to the TP brushes, absolutely twice a day, three times a day if they can. And I, I tend to, I tend to say three times a day, knowing that if I say three, they're going to do two. 
Um, if I say two, I know they're only going to do once or maybe miss a day. So again, it's just making that patient feel, well, just know and understand the importance of using an interdental brush. Um, and again, just making sure that that TP brush isn't too large because obviously we don't want to create the kind of apple core effect. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, we've got another question from Alison. Um, how do you explain to the patient why a referral to the periodontist would be advised and what the difference is between having treatment with the hygienist and the periodontist? Yeah, Very good, question. good, good, good point. Yeah. So, um, so the differences between the hygienist and the periodontal specialist. So I, <laughs> when I advise the patients to see the periodontal specialist, I obviously say it's the gold standard. Um, I actually call Fard the perio god <laughs> because he is. And um, he's just, the work that he does is absolutely phenomenal. The, um, the differences between the hygienist and a periodontal specialist, obviously we can't do surgical intervention. So for me, that's kind of the, the, the biggest point um, when referring. So, so yeah, so that's the biggest difference. He's got different instruments to what I have as well. And different, he's just way more educated than what we are. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely referral. It's not an easy subject to, to uh, speak about. And obviously I, uh, I also get a lot of patients saying to me, well, what's the difference between you and a specialist? And I end up saying, so the periodontal specialist, he's a specialist, he's a dentist that's specialised in gums. And, you know, he, he's, he can do so many more things than, than what I can offer you. I can offer you this, which is a non-surgical um, periodontal therapy. And, um, and the maintenance, obviously the maintenance of, of uh, hopefully if the patient sees a specialist, the maintenance of um, looking after the treatment that he's completed. So, and what was, sorry, what was the first one? I've missed that. Um, so how do you explain to a, a, a patient why a referral to a periodontal specialist is um, necessary? And what is the difference between what um, uh, treatment the hygienist does and a periodontist does? I think you've covered that. Have I just covered that? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you've covered that. Um, now, uh, one one more question that I wanted to ask, um, and it's it's a it's one that is in, that's intrigued me for many many years now. Um, now I've known you to be a fantastic team player, so you kind of hurdle the patients in the right direction throughout the practice. I've never known you to sort of unsettle. Um, uh, um, uh, d dental colleagues or hygienists but more often than not I bet I would say to a patient you will need one visit of stain removal and it's actually 10 or you know one visit of stain removal and it's actually two or three or uh, something along those lines so there's a difference in opinion um, how do you circumnavigate that? What, what do you do to get around that and get the patient on board to what you think you can deliver? Okay, so for example, I think what, what you're trying to say is when a dentist, for example, refers a patient to me and the patient thinks they're just coming for one appointment and I turn around and say, actually, you may need around five appointments, five hours to get this gum disease under control. How do, how do, you, how do I turn that patient around? So again, it's, it's showing the patient, showing the patient the pocketing, show, uh, discussing the flip chart, the oral B uh, flip chart. Again, my little Bible that I like to explain, um, use to explain to patients. And again, you know, it's seeing is believing, it really is. You need to explain all of this to the patient. And if they turn around and say to me, oh, the dentist didn't say anything about this, then I, I will always say, okay, um, I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, I will have a, a chat with the dentist at lunchtime and give you a ring, or I'll, you know, communicate with the, with the dentist and actually, 
the dentists that I work with, they, I think every single one of them will say to the patient, I would, I would really like you to see the hygienist. I think it'll be absolutely valuable for you and you'll get, you'll get great results. You may need one appointment, you may need more, but the hygienist will decide that. And I think that's what's so great about working at the practices that I work at. The, there's, we, can, we can all have a really good conversation and just kind of make sure that there's no gray areas to kind of throw, we don't want to kind of throw each other under the bus, bus so to say. So the dentists will say, you might need one appointment, you might need several, but Amy will decide that, the hygienist will decide that. And I think ultimately, I think that is probably one of the best things that the dentist can say to the patient, because that way you're not setting, you know, they're not setting anyone up for a fall almost. And the patient, the seed is planted again, I guess. Um, yeah, they, they kind of think that they might need a few more appointments. So it's never really an issue, to be honest. Yeah, so um, from my perspective, I think it's always a problem um, attaching a time scale to a prescription. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think it's useful to give a prescription so that uh, we fulfill um, uh, our, our, our um, uh, professional requirements as a team uh, and it's clear, but I think I agree with you. I think um, uh, setting a time scale to it is not fair on the executing party, regardless yeah. of who it is. Um, um, did you have to clarify that with the practices that you work with, or was this something that was intuitive when you when you joined any practice? So the the, the practice that I work at, um, where I've been there for seven years, that's been my biggest learning curve working there. Um, so kind of learn as as we go along, really, with that one. But the practice that I work that I've that I started four years ago. Um, I kind of went in and, and said how I work, these are, this is what I do, this is how I work. And um, yeah, and part of that was, it might be a good idea to say to the patient, you might need one appointment, you might need several, um, but the hygienist will decide that. And, and that has worked so, so well there. Um, so I think, you know, going forward, if anyone's listening and they're struggling to and they feel overwhelmed when a patient comes in. They've got all this stuff to do and managing the patient's expectations. I think, I know the dentists have got so, so much to do in their appointments. And, and I appreciate that, especially if you're on the NHS, time is limited, time is money. You know, you've got to get your UDAs through. Um, oh, <laughs> someone's <laughs> taking over my screen. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, but if they could just mention, you might need several appointments. Amy will decide, the hygienist will decide, then that would be super helpful. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Amy. Do we have any more questions from our audience? I believe I'm not seeing, I'm seeing some come through. Um, Okay, these are more questions. Uh, there's a question for me about my, what my, uh, my thoughts are on the current situation um, regarding the cessation of aerosols. Uh, or as far as I'm concerned, I think we're back to hand scalers. Um, and uh, I, I dread the thought because uh, a lot of our hygienist colleagues are going to struggle. Um, um, aerosol generating powered instrumentation uh, is critical. It's efficient. Um, I, I, I hope that um, that returns very quickly. Um, I see the use of external um, high vacuum, um, high volume uh, aspirators becoming the norm. Uh, but um, don't start buying them. Um, we'll wait for guidelines. Um, uh, a question for, for you from Helena. Um, how long are your standard hygiene appointments and do you feel you get enough time to do all your treatment? That's a very good question. Yeah, I think this is something that um, we discuss quite a lot as hygienists about timing and, and you know, managing to get everything uh, completed in one appointment. So for me, I have 20 minute appointments and 30 minute appointments and um, the 20 minute appointments are the maintenance appointments. These are patients that I 
I, I can actually, I can basically say which patients need what appointment. Um, so the patients who have very little to remove, they have a tiny little bit of lingual calculus, a little bit of tea staining, nothing, nothing um, complex. These are my 20 minute patients. I have to, I just want to mention as well, I'm very lucky from the point of view of, I have a nurse at both of the practices, um, which is fantastic. You know, it, I appreciate that a lot of hygienists. And again, I think that's another, another issue. And I think um, a lot of hygienists are, are very happy working on their own. I, I worked on my own for four years and I found it extremely lonely. I'm quite a chatty person, don't know if you've noticed. Um, and I, you know, I like to, to chat and talk and have a little bit of a laugh. And, and so for me, the, the nursing aspect is very important for me. But just going off on a tangent a little bit there. Um, so yeah, so on my extensive appointments, so these were patients that uh, maybe have a couple of pockets which need regular debridement, and they they are definitely half an hour of patients. They are the extensive appointments. The other um, other treatments that I offer are the non-surgical prodontal twenty-four hour debridement, and that depends on how many sites need to be um, debrided. So I tend to spend a couple of minutes down each pocket um, at a time. So I kind of calculate it very quickly, a quick calculation in my head, um, how long this patient's going to need. Um, obviously with the local anaesthetic as well, I tend to spend around 40 minutes to an hour on the left side and again on the right side. Um, but these, yeah, that would be a different type of treatment. That's my debridement patients. Brilliant, thank you so much, Amy. Um, one last question from Anastasia um, uh, about how long we leave between um, initial RSD and reviewing the six point pocket chart. Um, uh, what, what are your views, Amy? How long do you leave it? So I tend to leave it around six weeks between the, the treatment and then the initial, sorry, the initial treatment and then the review appointment around six weeks um, for the four mouth pocketing. And again, only charting over four, millimet four millimetres and above. Some people, um, I think is it Philip Owens? He advises three months for that. But I think it depends on your patient, really. And you've just got to, to lead it from, you've just got to kind of look at your patient holistically and think, okay, so is this patient taking on board all the advice that I've been given? How, how complex was this patient's treatment? If you're, you know, if you're just looking at a couple of pockets, maybe five mils kind of sitting on the fence and you're thinking, um, I'm not sh quite sure how this is going to go. I tend, I tend to six six weeks. I tend to do a, a review for. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Amy. Yeah. I think six weeks is more than adequate. Um, um, Good healing time. Good healing I, I, time. Yeah, I think most soft tissues would would have healed by week four. So yeah. you're allowing an extra two weeks, and um, you know you're not bone sounding. You're just. Um, uh, probing pocket depths, which is fine. I, I would just add to that that um, for, for Anastasia's uh, um, uh, just completion um, uh, um, and, and, and uh, being comprehensive, I would repeat that six point pocket chart a year later. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So th th that, that's okay, kind yeah. of uh, often missed. So just repeat that a year later and, and then that's, that's more than enough. Um, uh, and th th thereafter annually, um, but you're screening every visit. Yeah. Um, uh, and if there are any changes, you would do the full chart and refer or report and report to the patient. Um, now, without um, further ado, I think uh, it's getting quite late, uh, and Amy's got a beautiful baby boy, probably <laughs> driving her husband insane in the background. Um, I uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, on behalf of uh, the London Dental Academy, and I'd like to draw the uh, um, the attendance attention to the next um, uh, webinar on bronze and bronze. Uh, 